heat waves, drought, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, blizzards, bitter cold. Extreme weather has an incredible impact on people across the globe. On Mount Washington, our scientists brave some of the worst weather on the planet to improve our understanding of our warming world. Right. Hello and good evening, everyone. My name is Brian Fitzgerald, and I'm the Director of, of Education here at Mount Washington Observatory. And joining us this evening to share her work investigating wildfire particulates and severe thunderstorms is Dr. Ji Win Fan from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in Washington State. Thanks so much for joining us uh, for tonight's program. For those of you who aren't already familiar, Mount Washington Observatory is a nonprofit member supported organization with a mission to advance the understanding of the forces that create Earth's weather and climate. And we accomplish those things by our operating our summit weather station with around the clock weather observation and forecasting, by conducting scientific research and product testing, and by developing and offering innovative educational programs. So if you have uh, questions for tonight's speaker and you're joining us through Zoom, just ask that you use the Q&A button. You can find that at the bottom of your toolbar there on Zoom. We'll be collecting questions throughout the night and we'll make sure to leave some time at the end. So please get your questions in as they come up. If you're joining us on the live stream on Facebook, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us that way. Uh, while we won't be able to respond to your questions in real time, we'll have our summit staff make sure to help respond to those questions as, as soon as they can following the program. Uh, if you'd like to connect with us through Zoom for an upcoming program, make sure you register over at mountwashington.org slash SITM. Alrighty, so while we kick things off tonight, I'm going to go ahead and uh, before we introduce uh, Win, we will launch a little bit of a poll here for everybody. Some great questions uh, that Win got for us uh, tonight and one that I added here beside. So if you're on Zoom, you'll be able to see the poll questions coming up here. Always curious where you're joining from tonight. Uh, we'd love to know if you're joining from a state within New England here. Perhaps you're joining from outside of New England. Perhaps you're joining from outside the country as well. We'd love to know where you're joining from for this program. And then we got some great trivia questions related to tonight's program. What is the largest diameter hailstone ever recorded? Is it four, six, eight, or 10 inches wide? And then we have another question here. At what temperature range do forest fires burn? Is it 300 to 700 degrees Celsius, 800 to 1200, or all the way up to 1500 to 1800 degrees Celsius? And then last but not least, what percentage of lightning strikes cause forest fires or fires at large here? So anywhere from five to 10%, with options all the way up to 30 to 40 percent and I have to admit here I don't know the answers here myself and so we're gonna have to ask our speaker in just a minute I'll give everyone oh another five seconds or so here it looks like most of you have participated and three two one all right poll is ended here let's go ahead and share those results all righty, New Hampshire well represented here, a little more than a quarter of the participants this evening. Let's actually share those. Um, Massachusetts well represented, all of, our, all of our New England states represented tonight, and then almost a quarter of you from outside the region, outside of New England, and hey, even 4% uh, of you coming in from outside the country. Welcome, welcome to everybody. All right, and so we got... Uh, before we actually get the answers here, most of you selected eight inches for the largest diameter hailstone ever recorded. For what temperature range do forest fires burn up? It looks like we were perfectly split between 800 to 1200 degrees Celsius and 1200 to 1500 degrees. And then last but not least, what percentage of lightning strikes cause forest fires? Most of you said five to 10%. 
All right, well, let's actually find out what the answer is here. I'd love to welcome uh, this evening's speaker from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, Dr. Jiwen Fan. Uh, Jiwen, are you there? Can you hear us? Can you can you see me? Hi, Brian. Yes, yes, I can see you. I also can hear you okay. Excellent. Awesome. Well, um, I'm curious, as we were just talking about before, I actually don't know the answers. You didn't give me the answers um, to these poll questions tonight. I have some guesses, but could you, um, what, what, is, uh, what is the answer? I want to know, first off, what is the largest diameter hailstone ever recorded? I could have cheated, but I, I decided I wanted to ask you. What, what's the answer? Yeah, it's eight inches. Looks like most of all. Our audience got it. <laughs> That's pretty good. Eight inches. Um, I know that the National Weather Service has the chart with all the like, um, you know, like a softball or a grapefruit size. Does that even, is that yes. like bigger than a Baseball, grapefruit? Baseball. Um, Baseball. <laughs> a football. <laughs> yeah, probably more like a football. Oh my gosh. Well, okay. So then for the next trivia question, um, I believe, uh, let's see, can I remember it? How how hot do do forest fires burn yeah yeah what was that they were evenly split with those middle selections yeah it's uh, actually b 800 to 1200 that's the general uh, temperature range that sounds hot enough <laughs> <laughs> sounds plenty hot mm -hmm. okay and then last but not least what is the percentage of lightning strikes that create forest fires this one seemed really hard yeah yeah it's uh it's 10 to 20 percent really yeah that wow <laughs> that's an, and and so is that specifically forest fires too uh, this is generally yes because lightning um you know heats on the forest uh, and then this is generally cause the forest fire okay and and you know it's it's a it's a significant fraction and and actually, majority of the wildfires are a lot of cost uh, uh, by nature, you know, human, actually, the majority yeah. of the cost by human. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, that's still a pretty big percentage. But um, yeah. well, at any rate, I, we'd love to hear your presentation for the evening. Thanks so much for joining. It's great that you didn't have to get on an airplane to join us tonight, but it's great that you're joining us from your offices in, in Washington State. And so... Yeah, without without further ado, feel free to take it away. Great, thank you so much. I'll show the screen. Looks great. Okay. Um, let's see how to move this bar. Okay. I think uh, I should be fine, right? Okay. Yeah, and um, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to um, give the presentation. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk about the connected environment, um, West Coast smoke, between West Coast smoke and the, the central US storms. And usually people do not connect them together. So this is kind of the first study we connect that together. So I work at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, uh, which we usually call PNNL. It's in, located in the um, southeast of the Washington uh, near Yakima. And it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of a desert area, but uh, in the recent years, we are become much wetter in the in the winter season. We got much more rain now. You know, climate change. <laughs> so um, before I go ahead, I also want to thank my co-authors at PNNL, particularly Yu Wei Zhang, who uh, is my postdoc, work with me on this work, and also Ximing Liu, Jason Hao, Manish. Uh, Shrivastava, and I also collaborated with uh, uh, Kamara Homano in the um, University of Oklahoma and Kotak Yunwang and John Sanfield. 
the, the material that I talked today, mainly um, published in the study uh, in PNS, it was uh, um, published in last October. And also we have this new um, work with machine learning method to further look at the relationships, which is in preparation now. So wild file, um, we, lo we know that the frequency and the bond area has been increasing in the US in the past decades, particularly for West US, the increase is very uh, significantly in a faster rate. And particularly after 2000, there's a, the majority of the West file actually 61% have occurred since 2000. And the number of megafires, megafires, which means those has burn area um, more than 100,000 acres. They have been also increasing in the past two decades. And before 1970, there's no documented megafires. But you, as you can see in the recent years, in the recent decade, there's a lot of those mega fires. Both wildfires and the severe convective storms. Severe convective storms uh, are those uh, storms that are producing uh, flash flood, hail, tornado, stress winds. They cause significantly property damage and economic losses in the United States. And wildfires can impact those severe convective storms through two major pathways at the time scale of days. The first pathway is through release, latent and sensible heat. We know that they release a large amount of sensible heat that this could change meteorology, then impact the severe convective storms. The other way is through release and form a lot of aerosols. Those aerosol particles, they can impact uh, the storms through aerosol radiation interaction, which means uh, they absorb or scatter solar radiation. That's also change meteorology. That's also change meteorology and then change the um, severe convective storms. The other way is through aerosol cloud interactions. Aerosol cloud interactions means those aerosol particles, they can seed droplets or ice particles, then cause the cloud macrophysical uh, changes, negative heat change and feedback to the storm dynamics. The studies of wildfire impact on storms uh, far away from the source region is limited because generally we, we do have quite a bit of study um, about their impact on the paracube nimbus cloud, which we call the paracube. Um, but far away from the source region, the aerosol indeed can be, uh, the transported aerosol can impact the storms. But for the West US, there's a no such study because the West wildfire and the central severe convective storms, they are, they are usually separated by season. They do not occur in the same time because the West US wildfire occurs generally in the late summer, spring, uh, sorry, late summer and the fall, like August, September, October, uh, November. But for the severe convective storm in the central US, they generally occur in the spring and the summer. However, um, in the recent years, they, as wildfire uh, occur progressively earlier, they, they happen together. I mean, at the same time, simultaneously. 
So we call the core occurrence of wildfire an essential sphere convective stone. It's emoji as a new issue because when we look at the in the past decade of data, we didn't see until later of this years. Um, and then uh, also we didn't the, the stones, particularly for the stones occurring in the three or more consecutive days, the green and uh, the red, they, they didn't happen until 2018. So this is a kind of a new um, extremes, two extremes, compound extremes we are dealing with. And uh, when we look at it, because the cases are very um, rare, so we cannot statistically look at the impact, the relationship, but we indeed look at uh, all of these cases and uh, look at the correlation between the number of hail report with the bond area of wildfire over the West US. And we find a slightly positive correlation. This is just something to motivate us to conduct a detailed modeling study because we don't have enough data to get a robust relationship. So we, with the modeling, uh, with the model, we uh, uh, look at this uh, uh, single extreme event, which is a concurrent event in 20 years. Later, we look at the 20 years, actually, this is uh, the event with uh, um, three or four stones happen in the, you know, in several days. This is uh, the, um, the first event that happened in the 20 years and July, 2018. And then um, the, during these four days, over this Colorado, Wyoming, South Dakota, Los Nebraska, Kansas City, they, the stones produce fresh floody, large hail, and the best more size hail, and straight nine winds, larger than 90 miles per hour. And the, the total economic losses exceeded 100 million. Uh, yeah, 100 million dollars. So, you can see this are the uh, re recorded, uh, this is the reported hailstorm from the uh, Colorado during this event. At the same time, in the West US, the uh, significant wildfire events occurred in California and Oregon. And this, they, this event occurred before the first storm occurred which is a 26, and also this wildfire lasts much longer than the stones. You know, they continue burn for months. So the car fire is the biggest one, cost the economic loss is $1.66 billion. And then the Mendocino complex fire, actually this fire burned much more uh, acres than the car fire. Uh, yeah, the the economic losses is much less, but still very significant. Okay, so for this event, we besides the West U.S. wildfires, we also see over the Rocky Rocky Mountains, we see there's also fires going on, but they're much smaller fire fires, so we call them a local fire. Then for we want to look at you know why how what are the joint and the individual effect of the remote and the local wildfires uh, and then what's the major mechanism you know is uh, is kind of like what kind of uh, um, is remote fire contribute more significantly or local fire because the local fire you know have an instant effect, although they are small fires, but they have instant effect. They don't need to be transported. And, and also the fire release sensible heat and also large amount of aerosols, 
it's it is mainly through the heat effect or the earth effect. So, so this is uh, um, the terminology I will use. Uh, remote, remote fires means West US wildfire, local fires means those uh, over the Rocky Mountain area. And the remote heat effect means the, the sensible heat released from the West wildfire. Remote aerosol effect means the aerosol from the West wildfires. So here is a little bit about the model simulations. We use a very detailed uh, physical model, uh, wolf cam. This model, uh, we also coupled with a uh, spectrum beam macrophysics. This is a very detailed uh, crop macrophysics scheme, and uh, which is very computationally expensive. Uh, and we developed this scheme a few years ago. Uh, in 2016, uh, and then um, we, with this similar with this study, we want to also account for the effect of both sensible heat and the aerosol effect from wildfires. So the sensible heat effect, the parameterization for sensible heat was developed also by our early studies in 2019. We also use high resolution. You know, for this uh, broad region, include the Western Central US, we use three kilometer, but we zoom in the stone region for one kilometer resolution. And we conducted the model sensitivity study by turn off, turn on and off the processes and the effect to investigate the joint and the respective effect of the remote and the local wildfires and also the heat and the aerosol effect. So as you can see, this is the two meter temperature in, in the simulation. Well, this is the difference between wildfire and without the wildfire. So with wildfire, we have a, a heating. This is the average over the few days. You can see a large heating in this wildfire core region. Uh, and uh, the maximum heat at a particular time for from grid can be five degrees Celsius, which is a very low, you know, significant perturbation to the atmosphere. Okay, so we evaluate our model simulations with the observations we have. Here showing the evaluation in the uh, aerosol and the fire properties on the top here is the aerosol LD, aerosol optic depth from the, uh, the satellite MODIS measurements. There's a lot of blank areas because when there's a cloudy uh, and storm, there, there's a low retrieval. But uh, you can see the magnitude of the uh, LD and the model. From the model, you can see we captured this LD over the Western US pretty well. Um, we do probably have a little bit of under, underestimate in the LD in the central US. So this is the surface PM2.5, which we think it's more reliable measurements. And uh, you can see the circles are the uh, surface stations. And you can see the model and uh, and uh, observations generally agreeing with each other. Um, and in the surface, yes, we don't see too strong transport. But when we look at the the vertical profile of the aerosols over this uh, central U.S. region, you can see the aerosol peak at about two point five kilometer altitude. This is because of the transport. And this is a plume had uh, the correlation between the model value and the um, satellite measure plume had observed value. They, are, they are in general agree each other, which, is, which means the model in general did a good job in capturing the fire plume had. Here is the evaluation in meteorology. And 
on the this is two meet temperature and two meet water vapor. They this is compared with the soundings in circles, and also you can see we get the spatial distribution of temperature and water vapor pretty well compare observations. And then we we'll also look at uh, the profile in the lower levels, compare those three Sundays uh, at the three locations. This is S1, S2, and S3. And we can see with the wildfire, which is the red, and compare with the observations, which is the black, um, is, um, they agree with each other much better compared to the case with all the wildfire, which is the blue. Here is a precipitation rate and the maximum health size um, as a um, time involves from 26 to 30. As you can see, um, the, the observations of stage four, in general, we, we capture the precipitation in in the first and last stone pretty well the red line. However, in the in the middle two stones, we do see the modern probably our estimate uh, the precipitation. For the hail, it's this is just in general it shows we got some bulk range because the observations has a very large uncertainty. Uh, you know, there's two data sets. Mesh is a radar retrieved value and uh, SPC is based on the um, uh, report, you know, stone prediction center report. So you can see they don't agree with each other, the black line and the dotted. There are a lot, there are actually magnitude differences. So this is the problem, the difficulties when we invite our model. And point out to the more observations, more reliable observations needed. Okay, so here is the major results. We what I wish what I showed here is the occurrence of uh, precipitation rate um, for different uh, rain category, not a rain, moderate rain for those larger than twenty. We call the heavy rain or extreme rain, and then. On the right is the occurrences of a different hail category. And this is a small hail. And then one to two inches, we call the severe hail. Not the two inches, we call the significant severe hail, SSH. So the, the observations is the, uh, is the gray and the fire simulation is red and no fire is uh, blue. And, and this uh, black line used this secondary axis to show the percentage change from the uh, no fire to fire situation. So what we see is that the joint effect of both West and the Central US fire, which is both remote and local fire, they increases the occurrence of the heavy rain by 38% and the significant severe hail by 34%, um, which is pretty significant. The accumulated rain over the fall storm period, we see there's a 19% increase, which is also pretty significant amount. Here is to separate um, how much is from the contribution of the remote fire and how much is from the local fires. So when we look at the, the, the black line is the total fire, the contribution or the total wildfire effect. The, the purple is the uh, remote fire effect and then the lo local one is the green. And you can see, yes, for for the this is kind of like a PDF when we have an increase in this uh, um, moderate or heavy rain, there's a decrease, corresponding decrease uh, in occurrence of this very light rains. 
for the hair, they are almost, uh, um, you know, the increase, the wildfire increase occurrence of this uh, hair, non-severe, severe, significant severe hair. So the, the value on the bar actually shows the ratio of uh, each effect on the total wildfire effect. So you can see the remote fire effect uh, contributed to 67% and also 60% of the increase of the occurrences for the heavy rain and for the significant severe hail, which is pretty significant. You know, it's about 1.6 on or 1.5 times greater than the local wildfire effect. For cumulative rain for the remote wildfire effect contribute about 66% uh, uh, of this increase. Now we, we also look at, uh, because remote fire, you know, uh, the impact from remote uh, wildfire it takes time. So indeed uh, we see the, the increase is progressively larger. Um, from the first stone to the last stone, 29th. You can see the, the remote fire, which is a purple bar, gets higher and higher as it goes to 29th. This for precipitation is the same, for the hail is also the same. This is because indeed the wildfire also gets stronger uh, um, also because the transport gets more and uh, the nonlinear interaction, you know, the, the interaction with meteorology gets larger and larger as time uh, involves. So here is showing the, the if it's because of aerosol, many because of aerosol or heat impact and on the, in this, uh, Blue, blue bars, they are total um, heat impact. And the value on the blue bar is the ratio of total heat effect to the total wildfire effect. But the brown bar is the remote effect, uh, a remote heat, sorry, because the remote will have heat and aerosol. So this is to separate remote heat from remote aerosol effect. So what we see is that the, the heat effects, the total heat effect contributed to 54 and uh, 46 of the increase in the, in the heavy rain rate and the significant severe hair respectively. So this means the rest is from the aerosol effect or the aerosol heat interaction, you know, the non the could have non-linear interaction, right? So, both heat and aerosol effect are significant. All of this heat effect, the total heat effect, if it's because the remote heat effect are more important or local heat effect, so this is the way we, we look at the, there's a 60% here, 60% and 70, uh, 76% of this uh, uh, heavy rain and significant severe hail are from the remote, um, are, are the remote heat effect compared to the uh, total heat effect. So which means the remote heat effect is much larger, has much larger effect than the total heat effect. Sorry, this is a pretty detail and it's hard to follow <laughs> sometimes. So, we also actually look at the remote heat effect. They actually contribute 49, 58% of the total remote effect, which means the rest are come from the remote aerosol effect. And you can see the, ma the magnitude should be similar. So both remote heat and aerosol plays are important role. So then why we see this enhanced heavy rain and uh, um, uh, occurrence of this uh, baseball size hail. Um, this is, uh, we look at the storm updraft motions. Um, we see that there's a significant increase uh, in the occurrence of this 
the larger uh, updraft velocity. You can see um, accordingly, accordingly, there's a decrease of the occurrence of this weak updraft. But the strong updraft, the enhancement is very significant. So they see this, uh, this increase also when we look at the the remote wildfire effect compared to the total wildfire effect, you can see um, they're probably, you know, just contribute a part of it. The other part is should be from local wildfire effect. And they compare this total wildfire effect but with the total heat impact. Then you can see the aerosol impact should be significant in enhance the the uh, occurrence of this large updrafts. At least, uh, you know, either the purely aerosol effect or aerosol heat interaction in this complex system, they have nonlinear amplification. So then, why the, you know, we see this much um, not stronger um, convective intensity? And then we look at this local meteorology in the central United States, we found that the convective available uh, potential energy, which is CAP, and convective in inhibition thing, and then also the wind shear, and then storm relative velocity, SRH, all of these quantities used as a measure of the if the storm can become more severe or not. And this shows that from the um, blue to red means from low fire to white fire, you glow the, the screen. Uh, you can see for every storm, before storm happening, there's big differences uh, between the blue and the red. In the Cape, and same has less differences, but still we can see some significant differences. Uh, and also enhanced uh, uh, wind shear and enhanced the storm relative velocity. Not those values are the mean over the storm region, not the single uh, individual grid. So individual grid increase can be very significant as I listed here. This means the local meteorology become conducive to more severe storm. Then while the local meteorology is changed to become more conducive to the severe storm, we look at the, the moisture, the horizontal moisture fluxes and find out there's a, in this storm region, there's a significant increase the, the moisture flux into the storm region. And the moisture flux basically is the moisture multiplied by the wind. Uh, and then we found that over storm region, yes, because the large moisture flux, you have an increased moisture. However, in the other regions, you can see in the northern and southern regions, the moisture doesn't change much, which means the mainly because of the stronger wind. The stronger wind transport the moisture faster into this region. And we, indeed, we see there's a westerly wind in the low level, 850 HPA, and we have 700 HPA. They're all westerly wind and they are all get stronger. So the red means that gets stronger. Uh, and in the in the uh, the west wind gets much stronger, and uh, and then we see there's a much uh, wind shear will be changed when the wind gets stronger in the low level, and then um, yeah, much more moisture will change the cap and thing. Well, we found that the, this change. This flux, the moisture flux, and the wind change in, uh, zooming in this uh, stone region, it's it's uh, many um, the remote wildfire effect uh, contribute more compared to the local wildfire effect. 
So that's also expressed why the local verify effect is, I mean, the remote verify effect is much larger. Uh, and obviously when they work together, we have a much stronger increase. So they have non-linear amplification. Then the question is that why the western winds become stronger? So this is probably very complicated. And also it's difficult to disentangle because we have very complex interactive system. We have uh, your radiation, cloud, precipitation, surface, not surface, feedback. All of these feedback processes are in there. It could be because of those feedback cause the, the, the synoptic scale, um, you know, the, yeah, synoptic scale meteorology change. So it will be take a much more additional work to figure out this in such a complex system. We we are, we're trying to look at uh, an, in in the current uh, with the current study and find out there are some weak increase in pressure anomaly, uh, weak changes in the pressure anomalies. So on the west, we see there's an increase in the pressure. Um, although, you know, the increase is not that significant, right? Um, and then in the stone region, we do see there's a decrease in the, in this low anomaly, the, there's a low anomaly. Basically, the pressure system in the central US is a lower pressure system, and in the west US is a higher pressure system. So the higher becomes a little bit higher, the lower system becomes a little bit lower. And we also find out uh, this lower system is mainly because local wildfire effect this is a higher system because the remote wildfire effect. And this can be some correction because when pressure increase here, it will enhance the west wind. But the fire itself, you know, with the temperature, higher temperature, it will push the wind going up and move westerly. So it's it's just uh, um, yeah, very difficult to understand, uh, track down to the to to the whole entire closed explanation. But we do find that. The first wildfire changes the synoptic scale meteorology and uh, uh, make the meteorology conducive to more severe convective storms. Now, I also showed the yellow aerosol effect is another important, uh, 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 is significant. So here it shows that uh, as the time evolves, the, in the central US, the aerosol increase is uh, actually mainly because of the, the transport. So this blue line means without the transport, without the West US wildfire, we can see later in the later few days, the, yeah, there's a big gap. So which means the transport contributed this large increase. Well, the aerosol can enhance the storm intensity um, based on Many of our previous studies is that first of all they can uh, enhance uh, you know much more aerosols. I show here you know when you have much more aerosols, you could have much more smaller droplets, and these small droplets they provide a much larger surface area for water vapor to condense. Then you will in have enhanced condensation, which released. Um, a lot more latent heat. And then the latent heat feedback to the convective core will cause uh, stronger updrafts. Sorry. And this, this can have a more uh, supercooled liquid. And the more supercooled liquid in the well enhanced ramming. When, when for, for the hair in burrows, it will experience much more ramming and then make the hair grow larger. Then even without the stressed updraft, 
with more aerosols, we usually also have a suppressed warm rain, which will allow more cloud liquid being lifted to higher level so that we will still have more, through this we will still have more supercooled liquid. So this is very important. The more supercooled droplets, it's very important for the hair formation. A second way is that when we have a lot of small supercooled droplets, they form the smaller hair embodies. These hair embodies, the smaller ones can be re-entered to the cloud object. And this is called a hair recycling mechanism. And when they get into the cloud object, they will go through another round of rami growth. So you, in the end, you will have a big uh, hair. Now, this is the very recent work. We are trying to use machine learning uh, method to try to understand the, the impact. And we, we know that, OK, with the wildfire data, we only have very few occurrences. But there's a lot of prescribed and agriculture fires, which has happened probably in summer or spring. So we use fire data sets. Uh, from all these, which include all of the fires, uh, that will increase our case number uh, a lot. So may allow us to, to have significant cases to look at. It. We have about, uh, I think, 400 cases over the past 10 years with this data set. And uh, we are trying to also using the, the two machine learning methods, three best machine learning method, random forest and the extreme, extreme graded boosting, XGB. And this, these two models, we want to also build a model to predict the occurrence of the severe hail if it's, it's severe hair will happen a lot, which is one and zero. This is a target um, prediction. So we did that for each state over the century US, we call the century US a color one state, a color two. Color one, uh, we, we look at the many, just three, and color two, just four, and then, for the for the rest of the states uh, on that in the south, they don't have much hail happening. So we're focused on the states. Um, the important, you know, the predicted variables we put to those uh, fire related properties like bone area, fire power, the black carbon, organic carbon, and also meteorology like temperature, relative humidity, the wind. So what we found is that both uh, Rand Forest SGP models, they do reasonably well in predicting the occurrence of the severe health in the Wyoming and Colorado. You can see the accuracy is pretty high, like a 90%, large 90% of accuracy, and the recall is below 0 0.6, which is good. And we also for other states, you can see the the color two states. We also see some good in the accuracies, but uh, yeah, the the recall rate is much higher, which um, which means there's uh, uh, a lot of uh, like uh, uh, force along events probably. So um, we also look at the, this is a random forest, this is the SGP, the bottom one. We use this uh, um, future importance uh, uh, functions, um, the methodology such as uh, uh, sharp values that to evaluate if the, uh, what kind of variables are most important. So based on both models, we find that uh, Okay, the maximum temperature in the fire region and the westerly wind at both low level and high levels, and then relative humidity at the low levels in the fire 
region, black carbon, organic carbon. Those are all identified as important uh, contribution, which means this indeed confirms the, the effect, the West wildfire effect. At the same time, also confirmed the mechanism we reviewed from this single modeling study, single case modeling study, because we find that, yeah, the west wind, you know, transport, aerosol, and moisture is very important. We also find that the, the heat impact is very important, which means the temperature maximum tension in the wildfire region is important. And the aerosol, you know, black, brown, carb, uh, organic carbon. So this this is kind of like the for, for the you know validate this kind of effect statistically it, it may exist. Okay, so this is come to my last slide. Um you can see we showed that the West US wildfire uh, I mean, I, I will call the fire, a lot of wildfire, because in the machine learning part, we a lot of just look at the wildfires. So the fires, the West US fires can enhance the, the severity of the storms in the central United States here. Um, slow single case detailed physical modeling and the machine learning analysis of the 10 years of the data. This effect is mainly through change the synoptic scale meteorology, you know, enhance the winds, westerly winds, cause a much, uh, um, you know, cause a local meteorology change, which conducive to more severe storms. And then they increase the aerosol, and they still enhance the storm intensity and higher size through aerosol cloud interactions. And both sensible heat and the aerosols from the wildfires plays very important roles. The significance is that this work demonstrates the concept that uh, the upstream wildfires can be an important factor in influencing the severity of the convective storm downwind. And this just to spark more studies, to gain more robust understanding, because this is the first initial study. We, there's many uh, things were not solved. Um, and also more studies, for, study for more cases will definitely help. And also the study offers a new pathway of climate change impact on severe weather. Because we know that climate change will cause the increase of severe weather. However, through impact on wildfire, you know, increase wildfire and then wildfire impact the severe weather. This is kind of like a compound extreme, make two extremes, make a, a unprecedented extremes. So that's why probably we'll see more and more unprecedented extremes in nowadays. Um, and then this pathway may become more um, increasingly important, right? In the in the warming climate in the future, because uh, um, both west wildfires and the central severe storm are projected to occur more frequently under a warming climate. Um, that's that's what I have. Thank you so much. I'd be happy to answer questions. Hey, thank you so much to you, and I really appreciate that. Um, that was that was excellent. I really appreciate. That's clearly a lot, a lot of work that you and your co co researchers have been doing to try and model these events. That's incredibly impressive. Um, and I know there's for the folks um, who are with us this evening, there are a number of great questions that have uh, come up as well. And so I'll remind everyone with us. Um, in the program, if you want to submit a question, you can use the Q&A button. You can find that at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. Um, and we can just jump right into it because there's some great questions here. Um, an anonymous attendee asked a little while back, they're curious if um, what role or if you ever take into account if a fire retardant is used um, and what effect that may have on 
storms or any of those sorts of things? I, I don't know if, um, I mean, you probably you looked at obviously a, a, at least a couple different examples of a couple different fires, but I wonder just how fires end up getting, I guess, contained, how that may impact maybe um, some of the aerosols or things that you're seeing um, downwind. That might be that might be a really hard one to start off with. So I think the question is about it's about the fire retardants, which means uh, I guess it means the delay uh, of the uh, fire uh, transport of the aerosol into the central U.S. Yes, we indeed considered. Uh, so in the analysis, we we consider like there's two to four days. Uh, delay. For example, we will look at the fires two days before this severe storm events, or four days before this severe storm events. So we we request actually we only selected the cases in the in the uh, beginning where I showed the correlation for or for those few uh, fires. We only selected the cases that. Uh, with the storm happening in central U.S. and the wildfire has to happen in within uh, two days before the storm, um, which is, for example, if the storm happens in 26, then in 25th and 24th, they have to be have fires yeah. happening in the western U.S. Okay. So I guess that is, uh, yeah, it's we, from our model, we, we look at it, it generally takes two days to transport to the over Rocky Mountain on Colorado region. So two to three days, like two to four days, that's in general. Um, in the machine learning model, yes, we consider two to four days um, uh, delay in the transport. Uh, yeah. That's great. Yeah, well, and that's good to know because, I mean, also uh, another question that came from Ray was actually wondering sort of what you were just saying there, what the time difference is between when a fire occurs and when those storms are occurring. And I guess like you were just saying, it's sort of between that two and four day window sort of that you're largely looking at to see Yes. Yeah, before, how much time. Before the, the storm uh, occurring. So for example, in the storm, if a storm day is 26, then we have to have a fire occurring at least two days before the storm. Yeah, so that is in our initial analysis, uh, which I showed in our um, PNS paper. Um, but in the later machine learning analysis, yes, we consider actually for we can different the period. We consider you know, two days. We also consider four days. So we did uh, quite a bit of sensitivity. I uh, you know ignored all this uh, details there, but that's the question. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it just obviously you need some amount of time to allow for the transport of. Um, to see how long it takes for the transport of those aerosols for those particulates to make their way over. It's still a long distance, so it does take some time, I'm sure. And a, and a large a large fire, too, producing, you know, a, a lot of particulate matter as well. Yeah. Um, and also the meteorology interaction, you know, the heat interaction with meteorology also takes time to propagate some wind. Yeah. Besides certainly. Fires. <laughs> yeah, and uh, there's a lot of, I think there are a lot of questions, a lot of people who are interested in some of this and how, um, uh, even from our audience tonight, how um, these particulates are moving, how, what distances, those sorts of things. And Michael asked a good question. I think you had showed maybe in the, the schematic that you were showing on your last slide, even just Michael was curious. So during the, some of these observation periods, what was the mean position of the jet stream or the upper airflow from say like California to the central United States? So, I mean, is it a jet stream that is largely like way up high, even above where some of these particulate matters are that's generally moving west to east or is it coming down from the north or what is it, what are those 
Yeah, when we look at like. this uh, large scale jet stream, they are pretty high. Yeah. So they are a lot, uh, I think at least five to six kilometers. Uh, and so they are a lot affected much. So when I look at the wind, there is mainly the lower level wind, like uh, 700 uh, uh, millibar, they are at uh, like, uh, yeah, on the 850 minibar. I know a lot of people have question probably about the 800 mini, uh, 850 minibar, which we show in the paper, because uh, uh, over the mountain, you know, the surface pressure is lower than 800. Yeah. But actually in our plot, we, we indeed, when the surface pressure is lower than that, we are using the value from the lowest model level. So we are not to you know, do interpretation because uh, you know, there's no way we can do interpretation. So the value is still value, valid for the low level because we really want to look at the low level. So the transport actually happens mainly at a 2.5 kilometer as I showed in the aerosol. So which is a lot of the jet stream. I think it's just a large scale for, the, for that system, for that, um, particular case, the, even the low level winds they are pretty westerly. Yeah, westerly and south southwest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny. It's funny you use so much 850 millibar data because that's what weather observers on Mount Washington are looking at all the time for mm -hmm. trying to forecast. That's you know roughly the closest height they could look at for the summit of Mount Washington at a little over six thousand feet. And the two and a half kilometers, like you're talking about, I mean, that's more, I think, maybe like 8,000 feet. And so it's interesting that, you know, at, at these levels that, you know, you're seeing, I guess, the spike in these aerosols at yeah. not very high up in the atmosphere, actually sort of a little bit lower there, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah. We, um, we didn't and, find that change, much change in jet stream. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Well, and and I, you know, this is a question that's come up uh, actually, I wrote this question down myself, but a number of people asked the same question. They're curious. So obviously, um, particulates don't just stop in the central United States from large wildfires. They continue all the way across the United States. I mean, we see them on the East Coast. Do you have any sense of, is there even investigations into or whether um we know that there are other impacts maybe on severe weather uh, or severe thunderstorms in the eastern United States. Could could there be impacts that um, travel that far across the country? <laughs> yes, that's a good question. Actually, in the machine learning part of work, we did have a, another um, column, which is further down like in the Midwest. We call the CS3, color, uh, Central U.S. Color 3. We look at the hail, correction hail with the West U uh, wildfire from the, from the machine learning models, we see um, uh, much less impact. So, so indeed the, the impact is weaker, weaker. <laughs> uh, and, and that's why I didn't present uh, um, today uh, on that one. But, uh, but you know, if, uh, but for the other things, for example, the, the slow fall, here, uh, I think John said buffalo excessive slow fall. That could be because um, um, slow fall is more related to ice nucleation, you know, ice crystals, which they only need a very small amount of uh, the aerosol particles. So majority of aerosol particles are a lot iron, right? The iron P, uh, ice nucleated particles, they are very, very small portion um, of the, the, the total aerosol body. So if wildfires can enhance, uh, you know, uh, they, if they can be effective as nucleated particles, and they, uh, you only need a small amount, you can um, initiate the ice from the, the ice and slow more efficiently. And that actually deserves some study, yeah. It could be. I cannot. Uh, yeah, I know. Well, of course, we're we're all curious because this clearly what you found is is so significant for the central United States and 
it only makes us wonder over, all the way over on this side too. Yeah. And maybe just um, maybe just one more question while we have you. And, I, and certainly if there are any other questions we can't get to tonight, please feel free. I'm happy to pass along questions to our speaker tonight. You can reach out to me at education at mountwashington.org. Um, but um, this is a question I think both maybe related to what Allie and and Dennis are asking related to what is the presence of snowpack um, along the West Coast, along the, the Western United States? Does snowpack, do you have a sense of how that may impact ultimately what you're looking at, the severity of, of storms um, in the central United States? That's a good question. Again, probably the, the additional work to answer the question. Because of slow pack, uh, it's uh, first of all, slow pack is uh, it's more related. For example, the slow precipitation. Slow precipitation basically it's uh, more related to uh, ice nucleation. So wildfire by most bony aerosols can be um, effective or ice nucleated particles. Um, but there's another pathway. So the the bottomless body, you know, it, there's a lot of black carbon. They can, you know, um, deposit into the surface, the slow, and they make the surface much darker, and and then they are easy to melt. So that also can reduce slow. So yeah. so so it's very hard to say how this uh, wildfire would impact the slow pack. Uh, in both you know, central or uh, uh, west uh, mega west coast uh, um, slow pack. This is really interesting to look at. It. Um, need a need a study, and and that's that's good research as <laughs> a question. <laughs> well, I, I think we probably have a number of uh, current and aspiring scientists on the program tonight. So hopefully, they will take up the call to uh, investigate that because um, just like your work, um, what you've shown tonight, incredibly dynamic and complex systems that you're trying to investigate um, and really, really impressed with, um, with what you've been able to find so far and really appreciate you presenting this evening. Thank you so much for um, giving your time tonight and sharing your expertise. Um, just wanna say thank you to everyone else who's also joined tonight. Um, this is a, a free program here at Mount Washington Observatory. If you enjoyed tonight's program, if you've been enjoying our series, we strongly encourage you to make a donation uh, to help support programs like these over at mountwashington.org. You can hit the donate button in the upper right hand corner. I want to say a big thank you to everyone who supported uh, and donated during our year end campaign. It's because of you that we were able to reach our goal this year. So thank you again. If you have uh, thoughts about tonight's program, suggestions for future programs, uh, please say, take some time to fill out our survey, which will pop up in the Zoom window when we're all done here. And we'll also be in our uh, follow-up email. Uh, and then finally, don't forget to join us for an upcoming Science of the Mountains program. Uh, not next month, we'll take February off, but join us on Tuesday, March 7th, when researchers from the University of New Hampshire and the US Forest Service We'll discuss the concept of winter weather whiplash in the Northeast. And then also on April 11th, you can join us when Dr. Lourdes Viles and meteorologist Ryan Knapp will discuss the aurora borealis and atmospheric optics. So don't forget to register for those programs. You can watch any previous programs you may have uh, missed over at mountwashington.org slash SITM. And we'll see you again soon. Thanks again so much, g I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Have a great night. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.